Hello, my name is Richard Ebeling, and I'm the BB&T Professor of Ethics and Free Enterprise Leadership at the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina. And this is Economic Straight Talk, sponsored by the Future of Freedom Foundation. What I would like to talk about today is the life contributions and importance of the Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises. Ludwig von Mises was born in 1881 in the old Austro-Hungarian Empire, and he lived until he was 92 years old, passing away in 1973. His importance relies on his contributions to both economic theory and policy at a time when grave threats emerged and threatened the survival of free markets and personal freedom over the last 100 years. His first major book was on the theory of money and credit. In this book, published in 1912 and then issued as a revised edition about 10 years later in 1924, Mises argued that business cycles, the booms and busts of inflations and recessions, were not inherent within the market economy. Rather, they emerged and resulted from central banking mismanagement of a nation's money supply and manipulation of interest rates through the banking system. This resulted in a mismatch, an imbalance, a distortion between savings and investment in the economy as a whole, all of which set the stage of a necessary future economic downturn after the illusion of prosperity and economic growth. This, the significance of this idea also uh, arose from the fact that he then asked the question, well, if you do get into an economic recession following an artificial boom, how do you recover from it? And contrary to many of the ideas that have prevailed in economic policy over the last hundred years, Mises argued that the most important policy that the United States government or any other government could follow is hands off. That is, the government must allow the free market to adapt and adjust to the post-boom real world supply and demand conditions. Some prices and wages will have to decline so markets can be back in order again. Resources will have to be reshuffled. Labor will have to shift between jobs and some business investments drawn into their activities by the artificiality of low interest rates and money creation will be found to have to either be written down or written off. That's not a pleasant circumstance, but if one has done things that are harmful to one's body and necessary to then go through a recovery period, well, some pain has to come for the recovery and rebalancing gain. But perhaps the contribution for which Mises in his own lifetime became most famous was from the ideas in a book that he published in 1922, a book that in English is called Socialism, an Economic and Sociological Analysis. Socialism was on the rise, both before the First World War when it was an intellectual movement, and then in the years immediately after the First World War. Out of that First World War had come the Bolshevik Revolution, a communist revolution in Russia, led by Vladimir Lenin and his followers. They abolished private property in the means of production. They ended all market prices. They started to implement forms of government central planning. And this became an idea of a wave of the future that in the immediate post-World War I era grabbed the enthusiasm and the attraction of intellectuals and political figures and movements in Germany, in Hungary, in the Austria of his land of birth. And as a consequence of this, Mises began to challenge these ideas. He asked one very fundamental but essential question. Well, Mr. Socialist, now that you have nationalized the means of production and ended private markets and competitive prices and are going to centrally direct the economy, how shall you solve the everyday and mundane issues of what to produce, how to produce, for whom to produce? And Mises' argument was that at the end of the day, the socialist would not have an answer to that. He reminded the socialists that what enables a rational and efficient and productive use of resources in our society today, so that out of the scarce means at our disposal, we can basically be producing the goods and services that consumers want in the most effective and productive ways, there must exist private markets, private markets in which individuals can buy and sell. And in buying and selling, people make bids and offers. And out of those bids and offers are the higgling and haggling of the marketplace. And out of that higgling and haggling of the marketplace emerged agreed upon terms of trade. And from those agreed upon terms of trade develop the prices of the marketplace for both finished goods that you and I as consumers buy, uh, purchase and for the factors of production, land, labor, capital, other resources and raw materials. 
all of which inform particularly producers what is it that consumers want how intensely for various quantities of cer certain types and what about the alternative uses and demands for those scarce resources land labor and capital well does someone assign a greater value to those inputs in making some other product other than my own and I discover that by how much he is willing to bid for those inputs for his production processes relative to my willingness to offer prices for their hire in my sector of the economy and again through this higgling and haggling in the marketplace emerge the prices of the factors of production wages for labor rent for land uh, interest to borrow capital uh, prices for various resources and raw materials and therefore once these prices exist for outputs our consumer goods and the inputs resources out of which goods are manufactured the entrepreneur the enterpriser the businessman can then undertake rational economic calculation here's what I believe consumers will be willing to pay to purchase these goods these are the prices that I'm finding uh, are being bid for for the inputs the factors of production would this be a profit or a loss would manufacturing it with this combination of resources versus that combination of resources generate me a larger profit or a smaller profit in other words in value terms what is the most least, least costly and most efficient way to produce the goods that consumers want Mises argued that once a socialist system of central planning comprehensive central planning was imposed these rational means of calculation what do consumers want what are the relative costs of doing so would it be profitable loss making or what would be the least cost way of doing it are lost with no private property there's legally at least nothing to buy and sell with nothing to buy and sell there's no higgling and haggling over possible terms of trade with no terms of trade there's no agreed upon prices and with no agreed upon prices how do consumers know what things would cost and how do businessmen entrepreneurs free enterprises know what would rationally be the least cost ways of producing anything there would be no way and particularly when the government then becomes the central planner himself well as Mises later referred to it in the title of one of his smaller books written in the 1940s the system would generate into a form of planned chaos no rationality think of trying to be out in the middle of an ocean when the sky is covered and you can't read the stars and you're out of sight of land how do you even know where you are what direction you're moving in and how to get to where you want to go that is the analogy if you will of a complex economic system without a competitively established pricing system that gives order and rationality to the entire processes of production and consumption supplies and demands efficient use of the means at our disposal to achieve our ends I would like to suggest that while he was ridiculed challenged criticized in his lifetime no contribution has been at the end of the day so devastating as Mises's economic critique of the possibility of socialist central planning once you understand the logic of what Mises is saying you understand why at the end of the day wherever socialist central planning in any comprehensive form was attempted you saw stagnation inefficiency waste failure to improve the qualities and the standards of consumer consumer lifestyles and living and lines for goods that consumers really didn't want and the production of things that nobody wanted to buy in those socialist countries and indeed in the, in the early 1930s Mises even said that this critique of why socialism as an economic system cannot work demonstrates why at the end of the day socialism would fail which it certainly demonstrated it had by the 1990s with the symbolic collapse of the Soviet Union now if socialism doesn't work is there any alternative to a fully free and hands-off laissez-faire economy what about the interventionist economy the regulated economy the mixed economy and Mises reply to that is that that too is ultimately an unworkable system yes the government doesn't nationalize the means of production it doesn't attempt to impose centralized planning by a government agency on everything but the price system is interfered with government sets uh, minimum prices maximum prices uh, re imposes restrictions controls regulations all of which prevents the market economy from having truly effective and truth-telling market signals that is market-based and created prices 
and interventions and regulations that hamper and restrict and restrain the entrepreneur's ability to produce the goods that he thinks consumers really want and which he's betting his own profit earnings upon in the most efficient and rational way as he thinks best in competition with the rivals who are also competing for consumer dollars. It's like sand in the machine. The machine doesn't completely stop, but it slows down and the parts don't interact smoothly and effectively as they should. And the more sand you throw in through more regulations, more interventions, more controls, more restrictions, the more constraining the gears of the market system become until finally, don't be surprised, imbalances, distortions, wasteful surpluses, unsatisfied shortages of goods that are desired, and less efficiency and innovation and productivity than otherwise could be the case. So Mises's conclusion from this was that at the end of the day, there is no rational alternative if we would like to have personal freedom for people to make their own choices as consumers, as producers, as just citizens interacting and associating with their fellow human beings, and the capacity for the resources of the society to be used in the most effective way to satisfy the wants that we all have as consumers for the best standards of living possible, given what we know at a time and that which is at our disposal to try to do it with. So at the end of the day, socialism cannot work. The interventionist regulated economy is distortive and imbalancing and corrosive of market efficiencies. And therefore, Mises concluded there is no alternative to an open, effective, competitive, unrestricted free enterprise system. Well, what then is the role of government and society in Mises's framework? Well, it's basically not much different than the founding fathers of the United States said. Government should be there to protect the life, the liberty, and the honestly acquired property of the citizens of any country against violence, against murder, against theft, against fraud. But other than that, there are very few functions in Mises' mindset that the government needs to perform. Individuals should be left free to guide and direct their own lives, freely interact and associate with those that they desire in the complex system of the social system of division of labor for the mutual benefit and gain of all by trusting in freedom and seeing that freedom, when left unharnished, gives us that liberty and prosperity that we all say we desire for ourselves and those who come after us, our children, our grandchildren. Well, when you take these ideas of Mises's on socialism, the market economy, interventionism, and see the complementary contributions he made, as I said, in his work on money and the business cycle, that government intervention creates these uh, problems, that the hand of government brings about those artificial booms and busts and inflations and recessions, then we realize that what we need is a system that is based upon the freedom that the founding fathers advocated and people like Adam Smith in the 1700s proposed. These are among his contributions that are lasting. They're the responses, if you will, if you take a little bit of time to think about it, against these new proposals, a new socialist renaissance, the appeal for democratic socialism, as opposed to the evil Soviet totalitarian socialism. Institutionally, at the end of the day, like causes bring about like effects. The more the government controls, the more the government takes over, the more the government directs or plans, the less the institutions are able to allow people to have the freedom to guide and direct their own lives and to find ways to rationally and efficiently do things to serve their own ends in the process of bettering that of others as competitive markets are always tending to do. These are among the important and lasting contributions of Ludwig von Mises, Austrian economist par excellence. You can see the essence of all of these ideas put together in the book that is usually considered his magnum opus, a treatise on economics, simply called Human Action, which first appeared in 1949. Now, Mises left the Europe of the old world because of the dangers and chaos of the Second World War. He came to America in 1940. He lived his life here, the rest of his life, with the belief that this at least was a last refuge for those who were escaping from tyranny and for a country that at least seemed to still hold on to the principles of liberty and freedom. 
and prosperity on its basis. That is among the hopes that he had when he came to America as a refugee from a war-torn Europe, and why he kept writing until he died until the age of 92. His legacy is individual liberty, private property, free open competitive markets, and a government that secures freedoms and does not violate them through interventions and controls and restrictions in the market. Those are lessons that are as important today as in those earlier decades of the 20th century when he wrote them. Again, I'm Richard Evelyn. I'm the bb and Professor of Ethics and Free Enterprise Leadership at the Citadel in South, Charleston, South Carolina. And this has been Economic Straight Talk, sponsored by the Future of Freedom Foundation. I highly recommend that you go to the Foundation's website, fff.org, where every day there are new articles on the political and the economic and the social issues relating to real freedom and the autonomy and respect for the liberty of the individual, as well as videos such as ours among them being economic straight talk. Thank you for taking a little bit of your time, and until next time, bye-bye.